That brings us to 8.0 on the agenda. Those are our work session topics for the evening. The first work session topic is 8.1, which is the first quarter school resource officer presentation and uh, progress report, I would call that. I will turn that over to you, Mr. King, sir. Members of the board, this evening, Executive Director of Operations, Matt Bryant, and Assistant Superintendent of Secondary School, Scott Nielsen, will present information on the school resource officer program that will include first quarter data, information about completed trainings, and an overview on next steps. I'd also like to take a, just a point of privilege to welcome uh, and thank Lieutenant Robert Cook from Larimer County Sheriff's Office, Sergeant Robert Wincoop from Timnath Police Department, Sergeant Laura Lunsford from the Fort Collins Police Services, and Lieutenant Kelly Weaver, Fort Collins Police Services, for being in attendance this evening for your partnership and thoughtfulness in this work. Good evening, President Fev, board members, Superintendent Kingsley. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you tonight to give you an update, um, to work through some of what we promised. I think as we, as we stood here last spring and set a new path for our partnership with, with uh, law enforcement agencies from, from Timnath, our Larimer County friends, and from Fort Collins. And so Matt and I will try to to give you an update, give you a, a, a showing of where we think we are, and, uh, and then disconnect from that a little bit and share a little bit of our own data through first quarter. To ground us tonight, um, we want to talk about some of the things you'll see in the presentation so that you have some idea or it, some of our acronyms will make sense. You're going to see us uh, refer to the SOPs, which are Standard Operating Procedures. At school resource officers are SROs, FCPS are Fort Collins Police Services, DHS is Department of Human Services. Calls and assists are ways we refer to um, the calls that the police or the SROs get to step into some incident. And the page you'll see on dispositions is how we respond, or in this case, the dispositions will be how our uh, Fort Collins Police Services have responded. To, to calls or asks to assist. You may remember when we did our presentation um, at the culmination of the work we did last year, which as we start, sit here and think about all the work that was done over the last year, it was a great deal. I think the work that the community group did helped us to think about what is it we need to shift? How do we need to change our practices? What is some of the the opportunities we have for improvement. And I think what you'll see tonight as we talk, as I talk and as Matt talks, as we talk about the partnership, I hope that you see some of what learning occurred last year, how it's impacted some of the information we're able to produce tonight we couldn't have produced for this group a year ago. Um, much of that is a testimony to the work that, that Fort Collins PD has done and Larimer County and Timnath are in the process of, of doing the same work. We really appreciate their partnership. But last year, as we talked about our plan going forward, we laid out a rhythm for this year. And what we said was, we were gonna land the uh, standard operating procedures at a meeting with you in June. We were gonna do a training with our staff in July, and then we would get into this rhythm of a steering committee that would meet. We would follow the steering committee up with however that steering committee saw what we were looking at as information. We would think about what training we needed to proceed with. And then we would culminate that, I'll call it a, a triad with an update to the board. We sit there tonight in October with our first update to the board. We'll repeat that cycle two more times before we uh, step in front of you in May with what changes we may need to make with a contract and our standard operating procedures all of which we'll learn as we go through this year, meeting and going through that rhythm where we analyze how we're doing, we analyze our data, the data from the partnership, what things we think we need to tweak as we talk and confer with each other. As we set forward with the initial standard operating procedures uh, a little over a year ago, we worked toward those standard operating procedures because of some of what you see in front of you, we had disproportionate data. We weren't representing our subgroups equally in terms of how they were seeing themselves, experiencing 
um, either discipline with us or discipline with our SRO friends. We were seeing that our SROs may be being utilized in our buildings differently from school to school. It was not consistent. We didn't have systemic procedures for our SROs to follow or for our, fr our principals to follow. We were seeing our SROs were being asked to step in for non-criminal behaviors, things that we should be handling as school personnel, as PSD staff members. We had some misperceptions in the system around what restorative justice was, how we uh, allow students to engage with RJ Fort Collins, which is a phenomenal program, but the perception was having students get involved with that meant we were um, getting them in this uh, school to prison pipeline. Some of the diversion programs were the same way, so we wanted to clean up some of the pathways there. And in some cases, we've been able to build pathways directly from PSD staff to some of those diversion programs, but we've also had some help from our, our police services that have helped us create some different pathways to diversion as well, and for that we're thankful. We also saw mission creep. We saw um, our, our SRO friends stepping into things they didn't need to step into many times because they were asked by, by our staff members to step into things that were inappropriate, that we were able to address in a systematic way with some standard procedures. We talked about with, when we were in front of you, starting with a training for all of our administrators. July 27th, we did that training. We did three hours of training in the morning with all of our second edu uh, secondary education administrators, principals, APs, and uh, all of our SRO friends. We did some work that morning to clarify what the SOP said, to make sure there was common understanding, and then we did scenario training, where we actually had the teams work through two uh, challenging scenarios, led by our, our SRO friends, but allowing our administrators to work in tandem with the SRO they would be in partnership with in their school to process how would they put those procedures into place. That's work we hadn't done before in that, in that intensive a way. We followed that up that afternoon with the elementary administrators doing exactly the same thing. With, again, with our SRO friends and our AP and principals from each elementary school. They were there for three hours as well. On September 16th, we invited Fort Collins Police Services to bring in an expert around what's happening in the community, particularly as it revolves around marijuana and drug use. And they spent an hour with our AP friends from the elementary and an hour with our AP at the secondary level to build awareness and understanding with some of the administrators that might first interact with those incidents in their building. And then on October 1st, following our first steering committee meeting where we looked at data, tried to analyze what we were seeing most prevalent which turns out to be disorderly conduct. And so as we looked at disorderly conduct, we decided that training would focus on disorderly conduct versus assault. One, which is an incident we handle inside the district. One, which is a, an incident that we would hand over or refer to law enforcement. And we gave them a couple of scenarios they could work through to try to analyze, do they believe disorderly conduct or assault? And we worked through that with teams at each of the secondary buildings and um, helped them to paint a picture and understand some clarity and create some consistency across our district and how we might delineate the differences between disorderly conduct and assault. We also reiterated um, some of the team approach in regards to the SRO and how we might um, work with our SRO, our SROs in um, significant risk events in our building. We have a threat, for instance, and, and we made, we created some clarity around um, working with our SRO friends first. Um, you may remember some conversations about um, how we would update that, that in our contract, and would we update that in our contract, and Matt will talk about that a little sooner. But as we started thinking about that, we needed as a district to talk to our administrators about shifting our practices. That's ultimately our practice 
as we move into how we partner. And so we reiterated that day that when we think about risk and threat in our building, the experts, the SRO who's with us. So bringing that person in, bringing that person in the process to help us analyze what's our next steps was important. So we reiterated it that day. Um, maybe we cemented it that day that that is the practice we need to move forward with. And we'll continue to analyze um, incidents like that or opportunities like that and make those adjustments as we see fit um, and communicate those out as we move forward. Good evening, Board of Education. Superintendent Kinsley, thank you for having me tonight. I'm back. <laughs> and I will almost promise that maybe this one won't take four hours, but we'll see, right? But thank you for having me tonight. It's a pleasure to uh, present this information tonight. I, too, would like to acknowledge our, our SRO and our uh, police services friends and partners. Uh, we appreciate all you do and your officers do in our community, not just in our schools. So thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. So the first Matt, slide I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I have written down, since you, you brought that up, would you be so willing to introduce uh, the folks that have joined us and ask them to stand up? I, I think we should show some appreciation for the fact that they did oh, show absolutely. up. Absolutely. Thank you for okay. that opportunity to do that. So we have Lieutenant Kelly Weaver from the Fort Collins Police Services. We have Sergeant Laura Lunsford from the Fort Collins Police Services. Sergeant Lunsford oversees our SRO program uh, and is the direct supervisor of our SROs in our schools. We have Robert Cook from uh, Larimer County Sheriff's Office. He too oversees the SRO program for our Larimer County Partnership. And then we have Robert Wincoop from the town of Timnath. And we're excited to have Timnath uh, as one of our growing partners when we open our new uh, middle school, high school next year in Timnath. So thank okay. you all again for being here. I apologize for the interruption, but I really appreciate no, you bringing them forward. Thank you we, for, we truly uh, appreciate you having come to the board and joining us. So now I have to start all over. So <laughs> I'm back. Three hours and 55 <laughs> minutes, just giving you a heads up. So. <laughs> thank you for that, though. Uh, so what you see before you is uh, Fort Collins Police Services calls and assist information. So I want to give you a little bit of background on where this information comes from and uh, tell you why we're concentrating on the Fort Collins Police Services uh, information tonight. All of our uh, police agencies are doing the same kind of data collection. Uh, because of the size of the Fort Collins Police Services and the development of their uh, information and their data collection, um, we're using their information tonight uh, for this presentation. Uh, we expect in future uh, presentations to have the uh, data from the other agencies. Uh, so if you'll bear with us tonight, we're going to just use the uh, Fort Collins Police Service information here. This information is derived from a pretty extensive and robust daily log uh, that our SRO officers fill out. Any and every interaction they have is entered into this daily log and then categorized according to what it was, how it was initiated, and maybe what the outcome is, whether it's an investigation or what it might be. So what you're seeing up here tonight is not all these types in these categories were offenses. A lot of them were just reports. Maybe some of them initiated an investigation. Some of the incidences up here in the, in the, in the numbers may still be under investigation. And what this represents is about 29 categories up there and uh, 559 uh, calls and assists. This data was collected starting August 16th, the first day of our of, of classes, until October 8th. So you can see it's already a couple weeks old, and I can tell you things are probably looking different today than what they look on this chart. Uh, on some of these, the action is taken after investigation. Uh, some of them referred back to the school. Uh, Scott uh, uh, referred to some incidences that are school related and the SRO should not be involved in those. Uh, some are uh, an SRO school combination of action together that could include a restorative practice or a ticket being issued depending on the outcome of the investigation. A couple of the, uh, a few of these areas I'd like to uh, concentrate on tonight, uh, just to talk to you about them. Uh, if you look at the sex offense category, there probably is some uh, ongoing investigations in that number. The investigations uh, will include interviews with victims, witnesses, and suspects. 
But again, ongoing investigations, they may not be reflected in our uh, uh, slides later on that talk about the tickets and citations that are being issued. Uh, another one that I, uh, we wanted to concentrate on tonight and talk about is uh, one that brings a lot of sadness to our district. Uh, but we have been um, adversely affected by some suicides this year in our school district. Um, and as much as that uh, is a sad um, category to have, it needs to be addressed. And it has a lot to do with our mental health uh, conversations within our district. Uh, the responses to that could include referrals to community partners uh, for counseling services. It also could refer, it probably refers to or refer references to uh, school counselors and school mental health officials. I can tell you in that category, there are three protective custody referrals. So there has been responses to some suicidal um, calls and reports. Some of those are made on safe to tell. Some of them are made by students. If you see something, say something. We hear that over and over again. I can't stress that enough. Uh, the teaching category, you can see that there's 31 attempts or 31 teaching uh, um, Sorry, 31 teaching opportunities there for our SROs. A little bit about that teaching. This category comes from the uh, CAC work. Um, when they asked about what our, t our SROs do every day, what do they do in our schools? What is their function for us? Um, and teaching came up that that was one of them. In our teaching categories, we have things like um, teaching sixth graders about what SROs are. When they were in elementary school, they didn't really get a chance to see a police officer in their school. And they may have wonderings, what is, the, what is the function of this? How does this person relate to me? And these SROs have opportunities to go in classrooms and introduce themselves and introduce the SRO program and what is available to these students uh, through that. They also take an opportunity to teach um, classes on teen choices, uh, teaching internet safety, also discussing women in law enforcement. So there's a variety of classes and teachings that these, that these uh, uh, SROs are involved in. Uh, per the uh, Community uh, Advisory Council, we do have uh, templates in the schools that allow parents and students to opt out of these trainings uh, to receive that notification that are being used. And then alternative learning uh, for that day is, or that time period uh, is available for those students. So this slide here is part of the new data along with that past slide, but Scott mentioned that we didn't have this data a year, year and a half ago when we started this uh, evaluation of our program. I think this is important data because this shows how our, how our SROs got involved. We just saw how they're involved, but how did they get involved? Who initiated that involvement in the SROs? You can see here that 45% are staff reported. If you see something, say something. Again, with our students at almost 18%. And then there's a self-initiated down there, uh, uh, almost 11%. And I want to touch on that here in the next slide about what the mentoring opportunities and learning opportunities are for our, our SROs and our students uh, working together. You can see Safe to Tell is on there at 5%, and then some of the other calls and some of the other ways that SROs are initiated to help our students and our staff. This next slide is a bar graph. That, discuss, that shows the relationship with our dispositions to our reports that, are, that come in. This, re, this chart reflects the outcomes of our calls and our assists. Uh, I want to draw your attention first to the far left where it says blank and it says three. When we ask the uh, SROs, uh, Fort Collins Police Services, to provide us with their data, they were still refining that data and still looking at it and making sure all the categories were filled in, and we had three that weren't. Since then, I have learned that one of those is, was a motor vehicle accident, and a couple of the others were uh, secure hold statuses that our schools went into for various reasons. So those would probably be other categories that you would see in future reports. Um, there's uh, some, what I call the big three here. Uh, you see the larger lines. Uh, the first one is mentoring, and I referred to that just a minute ago in that pie chart about the SRO initiated contacts. This is, these are mentoring uh, opportunities, teaching opportunities that SROs might encounter as they work throughout their day with students. Uh, it could be that Matt was doing donuts in the parking lot. And the SRO uh, had, a, had a teaching moment there to uh, talk to Matt about his uh, vehicle safety and how he should behave in school um, PSD property. That may or may not have happened in my past, but we'll talk about that later. 
so those, these are moments that these uh, SROs use in order to build those relationships with students. Some of those mentoring opportunities may have turned into an administrative uh, referral where the SRO would ask the, tell the administration, hey, this is the third time I've caught Matt doing donuts in the parking lot. We need to address this. Uh, it may be that there's no reason to, to proceed with it and it becomes into those no charges category or it may roll into that referral category as I just previously stated. The next section is that no charges. That's where SRO has been involved. Maybe a student told them, them about something. Uh, they followed up and uh, there was just a, another learning or mentoring moment for these SROs to build relationships with our students and maybe correct uh, a pathway a little bit. And no charges were very because there's no law enforcement action needed. The next category would be the referral to schools. That's our largest category. In that category, there's 21 of the previous 29 categories on that first slide that are involved in that, that data. So I can tell you about 50 of them were disorderly conduct that Scott alluded to earlier about how those become uh, administrative issues more than they do law enforcement issues. Uh, some were welfare checks, but most of those or all of those were deemed actions not necessary to be taken by law enforcement agencies. There was no legal action to be taken there. And then you can go down through there and you can see some of the other categories and the statistics that are attached to those as far as the numbers of uh, dispositions that were handled during that time. So the types of juvenile citations and tickets that we have, uh, that our district has experienced and that our SROs have had to uh, address. Uh, the important part of this slide um, one of the important parts of this slide is at the bottom, that footnote, that all cit citations and tickets issued are based on victim-related crimes. It's important that our victims' rights are uh, taken into account during our investigations. Um, and all these uh, calls and assists, these, these tickets that were written, did have a victim related to them. Therefore, that's why they were proceeded with uh, the law enforcement action uh, to enter into the legal system that way. Uh, on the left, you will see the types of categories of uh, calls and assists and what happened there. And then on the right, uh, you will note that uh, that is broken down by race and ethnicity. The next slide, similar to this one, talks about the felony charges that, that uh, have been uh, pursued in our district uh, on, on our students uh, based on, again, uh, victims' rights and that the charges are based on a victim-related crime. Uh, you can see that we had one in criminal mischief, one in drugs, and one in menacing. And again, on the right, uh, there is a breakdown of race and ethnicity of uh, who those tickets were list listed or uh, assigned to. So to kind of wrap this up, I want to go back to our timetable that you saw earlier in the presentation. Uh, you can, Scott talked about our steering analysis uh, group, our committee that looks at that. Um, that committee has been hard at work. Uh, he also talked about some changes that we have made in uh, practices for our administrators. Uh, we did find uh, section uh, 5B3, which probably doesn't mean a lot to you sitting here unless you had the SOPs in front of you. Uh, that section uh, had to do with the discretion about criminal investigations and school discipline. Uh, we found a, a word and words matter. We found that as we continue to strengthen our partnerships uh, with our law enforcement agencies and our community that we learn that our language matters in our SOPs. And some of our changes will come about from language changes there. Uh, we learn that uh, bringing our contract changes or what we would like to do is bring our contract changes as needed. Uh, our plan is to bring contract changes uh, primarily in May when we bring a recommendation and contracts for review. Um, with, with a recommendation for approval or not. And these, uh, if there's anything before then that's identified that is of any substantial importance, uh, we would probably more than likely bring an amendment to the contract to the board and to our uh, partnering uh, municipalities uh, to look at that. But we plan on doing that in May with the contracts. So in closing and in service really of our future presentation, since this is our first presentation that we've made on this and you've seen some data that's never been available before, we just like to ask you what resonated with you and if there's any questions uh, that, we can, that we can help answer tonight or any comments that you'd like to share with us. 
Thank you very much to both of you. So uh, let me open it up to board members for questions or comments. Kristen, and then DJ. Hi, I'll start it off. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation and thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, the question I have actually refers to um, the SRO dispositions. And so you're talking about 141 referral to school. Do you know, like, of those 141, how many of those are self-initiated? How many of those were sort of like it was happened in the school, it got referred back to, referred to the SROs, and then it got referred back to the, um, to the, to the school? So you're meaning like somebody reported to the SRO, hey, I saw this happen, you might want to, and the SRO investigated it or questioned it and then said, you know, I think this is an administrative issue that needs to be handled in school. Am I yeah, versus like what you, what you all saw and, and um, initiated on your own, um, what was handled, you know, even sometimes maybe the school administration brings it to <laughs> you and then the SRO say, you know, that's not something that we need to be doing, it's, it's, it's back on you. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I have that number specifically what that is. I can tell you the majority of those in that referral to school are probably that specific incidents. That the SRO was at some point involved and then it was turned over to the administration to, uh, to finish. That's something we could do for the next annual. We, and that we, we could drill down for the next, right. the next we, time we're together. Yeah. That'd be great, yeah, if we can drill down to that. And then, because I, I think the, um, and part of the reason I'm asking is because the ideal would be to have those, have that number come way down so that it's not sort of a tag of I've got it, no, you've got it, no, I've got it, um, versus it becomes much more clear and well known of whose responsibility that is. Kristen, I, I appreciate that, but I, I also would say one of the learnings we've had, and I think that the tweak we've made in wording this year, I think was in almost fear of working as a collaborative team. And so as we really begin to understand the roles and responsibilities, I think coming together to collaborate as a, a collaborative partner, not a referral to law enforcement necessarily, but as an opportunity for us to come together with our expertise and to, to figure out and assign roles and responsibilities, that is one way for us to get cleaner with how we move through different situations at all sites instead of being uh, almost fearful, which we had some last year. We had as we marched through last year with our first year with the SOPs, we had some of our administrators who almost had a fear of connecting with the SRO and others that, that were probably still connecting too much. So trying to understand what's the balance and learn what that is, I think is part of that role we're in and part of the thing we'll measure and, and try to understand as a steering committee each time we're together. I appreciate that because that's that's what I'm looking for is is how do we and, and I think in doing so that'll that number will come way down. Yeah. Okay, DJ and then Rob. Uh, first off, I wanted to just thank you guys for putting the time and effort into getting some of this data. This is the areas that we were heading that we were asking about and trying to get better understanding of. Um, one of the things that for uh, you know, for me, and I'll speak just for me, I guess, is is, um, is kind of defining some of these a little bit better so that I understand them or, you know, define what these are. The one that jumped out to me was um, the family. Where'd it go? The family, yeah. Problems. problems, yeah, thank you. Family problems, you know, and like what does that mean? Uh, type one in there. And so it, it, it might be good at some point that, we have a little bit of examples of what some of these are and how how they're taken care of just to get better understanding of what that is um, but I do like the idea too of, of drilling down on some of them to understand the more information we have to try to figure out where we are having those rubs running a little wrong I think is something that is going to be beneficial so I'm excited to see this and I, and I hope that we could continue to grow with it and if I could just uh, to yep. respond to that, thank you for recognizing this data. I, I do want to reiterate that this was some hard work done uh, initially by the Fort Collins Police Services and some of the SROs in that program uh, in response to what they were hearing from uh, the council about what they wanted and what, how they wanted SROs to show their involvement in our schools. So uh, the, the kudos goes to, the, to these police departments for sure. Great. Rob? And then Carolyn. Yeah, <laughs> pardon me. I'll, I'll second those thanks uh, and for your presentation tonight as well. I want, I do have a couple questions. Um, 
One of them is that we had said, and you did in the first training, a joint training with the SROs and the staff, it wasn't clear to me that the, that the assault versus disorderly conduct thing was done as a joint training. Was it? And if not, why not? Just from the point of view of making sure that everybody's on the same page. So we, we talked a bit about disorderly conduct and assault at the training in July. Yeah. But when we noticed that at, at the time we met as a steering committee late September, um, we noticed that disorderly conduct was up, was the, the highest number sure. that we were seeing in the buildings. So we felt like doing scenario training on disorderly conduct versus assault made sense. We talked about it in July. We did scenario training on it where they actually got to think through, okay, so we have a situation. Do we move through it as disorderly conduct or do we move through it as it might be assault? And it was fascinating to see where our administrators were and to begin to think about what is the differences between the two and how do we identify um, the, the maneuvers that they make in consultation with uh, their team, their administrative team and law enforcement. But, but that was the difference for us is we were defining, we didn't do scenario on that at the, the bigger training. We did that at the, at the October 1 one. And, and the feeling was that the scenario training, having the SROs involved in the scenario training wasn't, wasn't the best use of their time in this context? We had some SROs present in, uh -huh. in the October 1st training. Um, they were not given what was going on that morning. They were not all present. Mm -hmm. um, that was a school day, so there was... Um, where we, July 27th, we were able to say everybody's there. Yeah. Um, we'll continue to, to uh, process how that goes going in, in the future trainings. Okay. I'll ask a second question, and then I'll give it to Carolyn, and then we can circle back. Um, one of the things we had talked about for mental health uh, challenges, uh, uh, in this case showing up on here as suicidal uh, 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 calls, was a joint re response with mental health professionals and not just the SRO. Ha has that been happening? Yeah, so I, I can give you an example of how that would work. Um, if a report uh, comes in from another student, see something, say something, uh, say through Safe to Tell or another form to the mm -hmm. SROs, uh, they are then engaged with the uh, response team at the schools. Um, if the student is at home, a home visit is made. Um, during that time, uh, referrals are made uh, for the family, uh, working with the family. For referrals can be made to our community partners for uh, counseling, but our mental health teams are also part of those response teams at the schools, so they're involved uh, with that investigation and with that help with that family as well. Um, in part, so another uh, response to that would be the mental health holds that I told you that we had three of those this year. Um, all that's done in conjunction as a team uh, where the SROs, if they're the first ones to receive that information, uh, they then engage the school teams. The school teams and the SRO teams work together and bring in whatever mental health supports they need from community and school uh, to address that. So you're pretty confident then that those 14 suicidal uh, calls slash assists, not only was the SRO present, but some mental health professionals were there in conjunction with those folks? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn? Okay, I think Kristen was kind of alluding to this earlier, and um, I was wondering how many total calls did we have, not for last year because that was affected by virtual learning, but for the year before, so we can have some kind of year-over-year -year calls so we can kind of see where we've been, where we are, and, and maybe where we're hoping to be going. So I was really kind of curious about how that goes. Was it 559 calls for Correct. so far this year? So compared against not last year, but the year before. Yeah, we have 559 calls right now. And I think when I referred to earlier, we wouldn't have been able to do this before. I think Fort Collins police wouldn't have been able to do this before. We didn't have this granular detail. Mm -hmm. This came out of some of the work that was done uh, in this room and by the CAC last year in what we were asking for. And quite mm -hmm. honestly, Laura took that and tried to figure out how to make it happen with her team um, and built uh, the ability for them to take a look at this and monitor from the, the stu uh, school resource officer side. And I think what's important about their side is, is this. We couldn't answer this a year ago either. In fact, one of the board members asked us this last year because what the CAC was saying was um, that, we, that staff was asking for too many responses from the SROs when this at least helps us understand how many of those 559 are coming from PSD personnel 
and how many of them are coming from safe to tell or self-initiated or are coming from a student directly or a parent requesting. We didn't have this information directly either about all of the incidents we were involved in last year, the year before, the year, year before that. So this is new baseline for us. We're going to work with it. We're going to work going forward. One of the things I really appreciate is not only did Laura work with her team to help create this kind of uh, data view, but Robert from Larimer County is working with, with Laura to figure that out. And as we think about all our partners, they'll do the same kind of work to help uh, illuminate what we're seeing. Okay, thanks. Great. Jess? Uh, so I have, I have two more comments, I think, for future, or maybe they're questions if you can answer them now. But um, one is I see that we're collecting data partially on race of students, but could we also maybe break this data down by students with IEPs, 504 plans, and or mental health? Because I know s there's a, a number of parents who have had concerns mm -hmm. that's also not being addressed. Um, and I guess maybe my second question or comment is, um, can we also get data, like, we, so we have this pie chart on, they were notified, but I'd also like to know, what were they notified about? So if we're having a lot of staff reporting, but it's about those suicidal students, that's very appropriate staff reporting. If it's staff reporting on maybe something, I don't know what ex exactly it would be. I, mean, I expect staff to be the primary person reporting, I guess. They're the ones, they're the adults in the room, they're the ones there. Um, but I'd like to a better breakdown of like where this reporting is going and what's it referring to. Director Zamora, can I uh, just make sure I'm hearing it well? If I were to take this chart and cross-reference it with this one, um, that's what you're kind of asking for is, okay, that helps me. Thank you. Okay, great. Kristen? Uh, one other thing to throw into there, if it's possible, is if you have multiple referrals about the same person from different teachers or different um, you know, maybe one's a teacher and one's a parent. So just cross areas, you know, so you can know that you had five references, but it only refers to one incident, that kind of thing. I don't know if that's possible. Thanks, Kristen. Rob? Okay, so questions three and four. Um, you had, um, we had talked a lot about restorative justice practices, uh, and I'm, I'm not entirely clear how that maps into the dispositions on the slide after this one. And similarly, we do get notified of expulsions and suspensions on a regular basis. Uh, and so I'm wondering how any of that maps into this stuff. So Rob, I, I, we're gonna, as we separate and slide out of this presentation, I'll give you some overview and I'll talk a little bit about some suspension and expulsion data and some of the process changes that the board helped us make in the spring. Sorry, and then the, the fourth question, <coughs> sorry, is we had set in place, I think, a uh, feedback system. Feedback is maybe the wrong word. Uh, 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 I'll just call it feedback because I can't think of what the word is right now. But uh, a system basically whereby students and staff and SROs for that matter could anonymously uh, report, I think is the word that Christoph just reminded me of. <laughs> oh God, anyway, anonymously report um, uh, how their interactions with SROs went, or from the SROs perspective, how their interactions with students or, or the staff went, uh, the administration went. Have we got, is that in place? What's the volume of uh, uh, reports that have come in and what are they telling us? So we just finalized the development of that, and so your feedback uh, is, is appropriate to call it that. Uh, we have just finalized uh, that process uh, through IT on how to get that uh, digitally available. Our plan moving forward is to have uh, QR codes set up in schools to make it simple for a student to walk by, hit a QR code, it takes them to that form. Uh, they can give that feedback, and to your point about the SROs uh, providing feedback as well, part of the evaluation process uh, moving forward in, in, through throughout this school year will be to allow uh, not, not just uh, staff and students to evaluate the SRO program, but also to evaluate, have the SROs do an evaluation about how they feel uh, our interactions and our partnerships are going. So we should see that feedback uh, form uh, up and running soon. So we anticipate being able to say something about the content of it at the 
next quarterly report? I believe uh, by next quarterly report, we should have some data related to that. Thank you. Jess? And I just wanted to make a comment. This is like, this is, it feels like a really huge lift for SROs, for you guys. And I really appreciate that you guys are collecting this data, that we are able to make more informed decisions this way so that we're utilizing um, the SROs that are in our schools to the best of our ability and not kind of abusing that relationship, which maybe we were doing in the past. Um, so just thank you. Thank you for putting the effort into making this happen. Thank you. Okay, and I'll just uh, kind of segue off that because I, I find that uh, by going towards the end, I, a lot of questions are really well handled by the board, but I also uh, want to kind of say thank you. I, I felt like last year uh, was a really important year in the system. Um, however we got there, we, we felt a sense of urgency to address this, and I felt like our community asked us two things. Uh, through the survey, we found out that our community resoundingly uh, appreciates having SROs in the schools, and that does not mean that everybody did. Uh, there, there were some people who, who expressed some concerns with it. The second item I felt like we had was uh, a, just an urgent request for us to review and reflect and kind of hone in what we're doing. And I think this evening what I appreciate is seeing that that work has begun and uh, things are well underway. Again, I think we really appreciate having the police departments show up, be part of the conversation, and work with us. That was another thing I felt like I learned last year is that uh, our departments really want to be part of the solution and serve our students and our families. So much appreciated on, on all those fronts. Board members, are there other questions on this subject before we move over to the discipline uh, review? Okay, because that really leads nicely towards the next part of it, and I'll turn that over to you, uh, Superintendent Kingsley. Well, prior, as we as staff begins to transition and, and queue up the the next slide deck, I, I want to just oh. no, it, it's okay. I, I just want to comment again on the incident reporting system that Director Vice President Patterson brought up. I believe so. We're approaching the beginning of November. Our next quarterly update, I believe, is in is Jan kind January. of in queue to come back in January. Yeah. So I think at that point in time, I don't want to over promise and under deliver to this board or to the community, right? So I want to be clear that I think we're in a place where we've worked out some of the technical kinks and we can begin to articulate what our scale like rollout plan is of communicating to our district stakeholders on how to access the incident reporting, the purpose, the functionality, how it's different than safe to tell. As you mentioned, Director Zamora, that's a big lift. Uh, in search of making sure that we have really, really clean data. So I believe we'll be positioned in January to articulate clearly where we are in that rollout process. But to come here with specific data on where we are, I think would be, I'm fearful of over-promising under-delivering on that. I just want to be clear and name that here. Greg? As we close the presentation on the SROs, one of the things that I, I just want to acknowledge is we have our SRO partners here tonight um, but they're also part of our steering committee. They're here with us um, when, we, when we meet as a steering committee. Um, Laura's been willing to meet with, with me several times this fall uh, as we prep for training, but also as we just clarify how we're going to respond to things so that we're on the same page as we're given principals and SRO advice. That partnership um, has been cleaner this year, too. We've spent far more time understanding each other's roles this year and, and I just want to honor that and say I appreciate that from from all four of you that you're willing to give up your time to partner with us as we plan and continue to move forward with the partnership. As we shift um, to the discipline side I think one of the things that got a little bit convoluted last year um, was as we were talking about what was going on with SROs and the SRO partnership and some of our data um, I think we ended up um, looking at them as the same thing. And so tonight we wanted to break, break free of that and as we move forward, the next time we come together to talk about the SRO update, it'll be what you just saw with some of the questions you just asked that were great. I think that will enhance our presentation. And, and for the discipline, you can expect, as Dwayne talked about last year in the monitoring report, robust out, uh, report out on where we are with our discipline. So tonight, if you will, as a tease, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the things we put in place, um, but it's not a robust presentation on one quarter of data. Um, it is a snapshot of in time of where we are. 
But I also think it's important to, to remember a couple things we put in place last year as a district um, to help with students and help with things like expulsion. We shifted practice around how we respond to drugs and alcohol. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit, about some of the, the outcomes that we have seen and where, where, uh, where some of the, that change in practice has assisted us um, and, and possibly where the proof is still in front of us to know exactly how effective that's going to be. But right now it looks pretty promising. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, where we are in terms of suspensions and it, as we break it out into a couple of different subgroups and then take some questions from you. If you remember uh, Dwayne in the monitoring report in uh, February when he did that, he put in at the end of the monitoring report a slide that looked much like this. Um, discipline by ethnicities. Dwayne would tell you if he was sitting here tonight that, that a change this slide over last year's slide is, or if you recall that slide was for 1819, I think it was the data Carolyn asked about because we didn't have good solid data from last year. So this pie chart that was in the monitoring report was for that year in the rears. Um, but as we look at this, our Hispanic uh, count is up by 1%, and so is our Hispanic discipline count. Both of those numbers are up 1%. Dwayne asked me to pass that along just so if you looked at them year over year, you would see that those are up by both up by 1%. But I think as you take a look at this to orient ourselves as a district, this pie chart is showing us that we have 71.1% of our overall population identify as white. That's the red part of the pie chart. And 57% of the discipline events are represented by students that identify as white. It's also important as we look at each of these pie charts that each incident is one child. So it's, it's one child, one incident. It's not one child maybe representing five different incidents. So I think that's clarity. It's a different kind of pie chart. And I think it's important as we move through that to, to understand that's what this represents. And that's why you're able to compare the overall population to what percentage of that population has had at least one discipline incident. It could very well be that under there some of them had more than one, but what we know is that percentage of the population has had at least one discipline incident. So that's our overall quarter one data for our overall student body. If we break it down and look at the elementary, we have 70% identifying as white, the incidents are 66%. If we look at the blue, we're 21% Hispanic. About 27% of our uh, disciplinary events are Hispanic. Just for context, just to lay the foundation for what I'm going to talk about at all three levels, if we take a look at the number of events for our Hispanic students at the elementary level, there are 92 minors and majors for our Hispanic population, and the overall circle is 404. 4% 4 of that overall circle received out-of-school suspension. So 4% of that received some out-of-school suspension. And of the, the Hispanic students, about 6.5% received a day or more of out-of-school suspension. So it's balanced pretty well in terms of what the outcomes were. As we move to the middle school, at the middle school level in PSD, we're just a little over 19% Hispanic, 72% identify as white. And as discipline events, 34% of our disciplinary events were students that identified as Hispanic and about 55% students that identify as white. Similarly, the overall pie chart represents 579 minors and majors. 24% of those students received at least one day of out-of-school suspension. So 24% of that pie chart on the left, those students received at least one day of out-of-school suspension. At the middle school level, there are 197 um, Hispanic uh, incidents. That's that 34%. 
and 27% of those students received at least one day of out-of-school suspension. So roughly the same percentage in that category received an out-of-school suspension of one day or more. As we move to the high school, you can see the percentage stays relatively the same in terms of uh, it's, it's up by a little bit on the total population side to a little over 20%. 34%, 34.7% of our Hispanic students had at least one um, incident, discipline incident. And again, if I were to talk about the overall incidents, majors and minors at the high school level, there were 424 on that left circle. There's 424 incidents. Um, I'm sorry, on the right side. And 104, uh, of the 424, 52% of the students, so a little over half, received one day of out-of-school suspension. Of the Hispanic, there were 146. That blue 34.7 represents 146 students. And 50% of those students received one out-of-school suspension, so slightly lower than the overall population. So as we think about the, where does it represent with suspensions, our, our out-of-school suspensions is down uh, dramatically over our 18-19. Our number of incidents is down a bit. Our number of major incidents is down quite a bit. Um, in terms of restorative practices, um, we, we have lots of restorative practices in place. Um, the monitoring of it is in process. So we'll continue to build out the monitoring of it so that we're able at, hopefully by monitoring, have some um, ability to show you what the output is in terms of those practices, what we've got in place, that you, so you can see what's happening instead of in school or out of school suspension. But one of the changes we made was for the drug and alcohol I talked about at the beginning. And we have had, to this point this year, 18 students who have... Um, had an incident involving drug or alcohol that could have required it an expulsion. But if you recall, we put in place a pathway to get some support. Um, working with the center, uh, Lori at the center has been fantastic for us. She's, work, she's working super hard to build um, a, a pathway, an outcome for students. Right now, of the 18, five students um, have had that diversion revoked. And, and some of that because they either were using drugs again at school. There was at least one that was an assault um, at a school um, of a staff member. And others uh, refused to continue with the program. But 13 of the 18 right now continue in the pathway. And as I say, in Lori's words, it continues to be promising. But we knew when we went into it, having a program that was lasting somewhere between seven and ten weeks, um, that was a commitment we were asking students to make to get that assistance. And so when I talked at the beginning about the proof is still out in front of us, the proof is still out in front of us in terms of how we monitor the changes we made and do we need to modify those changes as we look at, at things going forward coming out of year one and into year two of those changes. In addition to those 18 that were in the diversion pipeline, we have four other students that were expelled that you've seen paperwork on um, for things ranging from multiple um, drugs plus a, a assault on a staff member to uh, a weapons incident. So. Those are the, the things where we're still in a position where that's, that's how we're going to move through it right now, and Troy's working with those. One of the things we've, we've looked at is what duration are we, are we um, upholding for those expulsions, and that's a conversation we'll continue to have. I think the board asked us to process that as we thought about students that end up in that window. So for me, as we think about the changes we made, um, it feels positive. It feels hopeful, which is what we talked about in this room, was we wanted to have some kind of um, ability as we're holding students accountable to also foster hope, which is a critical piece to modifying behaviors. And I'm happy to say as we go through that, that the partnership with the center has been fantastic, a great resource for us to have. 
It also is, is uh, an accessible with, when you go through law enforcement. But in our case, right now we've got a clean pipeline. The other thing that uh, has come on our radar um, as the year got started, thanks to uh, um, a partnership or a, a group of individuals that's coming together in the community to talk about gun safety, is a direct referral that can be made by our SRO partners to RJ Fort Collins for students that make threats, um, have weapons, um, risky behavior like that, we can make a direct referral working with, with our law enforcement partners to get them into classes offered by RJ Fort Collins. And that's new, that didn't exist, I don't, that didn't exist a year ago. So that's another avenue for us that feels positive, again, feels like it's, a, it's an opportunity for learning and to, to allow for hope to continue. As, we, as I close tonight, I just wanna talk about, um, we'll continue the implementation of restorative practices. They're critical. Um, that's about how we talk, how we set up, how we structure classes, how we um, allow voice to provide belonging for students. Most of the discipline incidents, um, if we shaped the way we help students belong, could be curbed or encouraged before they ever happen. Uh, maybe I can't say most, but many could. So we'll continue with that work that's, that's proactive, not just reactive. I think often we think about discipline as being reactive. Some of the best discipline work you do is proactive work to help students feel like they belong and that they're truly part of and they live and have a place, an experience that they know um, is a fit for them in your building. We'll continue to analyze data at all three levels around attendance, connections, and grades. That our connection survey will be done shortly. We'll be able to look at that. Um, we have on the agenda for both elementary and secondary next week to do a little deep dive on quarter one behavior. And we'll be looking at attendance and our grades, monitoring of grades will continue as it has all through this year as we continue to analyze the impacts of those on how students are interacting with other students or adults in our buildings. We're, we will, as we dig into our behaviors, be looking at our own dispositions. You saw the dispositions for um, Fort Collins Police Services in an earlier slide. We'll be analyzing our dispositions at the school level as part of our work next week um, with our principals as we get out of quarter number one to analyze how are we responding to different behaviors in our buildings. Um, as we do that, we continue to work on uh, a, a discipline matrix that will give guidance to teachers about that proactive work I just talked about, but also um, help our administrators understand what, what might be possible uh, avenues or moves they can make uh, when it's not just proactive, but when it's reactive. And then we are uh, committed to monitoring over time. And that for us, as you see a shift in practice, you're gonna see outcomes change over time. This is not the kind of data that's gonna change overnight. It's gonna to have to be a process and systemic. And we're engaged in continuing to monitor at this level, but down to the schools as well. So um, as we continue to go forward, that's the commitment we, we are making to continue to keep this on the forefront. And with that, I would ask the same question, are there things that resonated with the board? Nate? Yeah, that last slide, what do you mean by minimizing variability? School to school with the same type of incident? I think or? when you think about variability, Nate, you get variability inside a school, teacher to teacher. Um, you might have teachers that interact with um, a student that needs extra attention in the classroom. A move like moving toward them and just having a quick conversation is different than a teacher that stands at the desks and challenges a kid to be sit up, do whatever they need to do. So there's variability teacher to teacher, but there's also variability school to school um, in terms of how we might interact. But having the conversation and trying to look at our um, our own dispositions is pretty important in understanding what variability we have right now. Other questions? Ron? So I have uh, two this time. One of them is about, uh, is just a request. And that is, as we see this data over time, 
and for that matter, as we see it in the monitoring report, if we can figure out some way to show trends, that would be great because it's hard to, hard yeah. to see whether we're doing better with those pie charts or not. Yep. You know, so do, yeah, Dwayne is Dwayne is invested and looking forward to it. Great. Okay. So that's that's one thing. The other thing is, and this sort of applies to the last presentation and this one, and ties in some of what I think we heard in community comment tonight. And that is, my understanding is that some some non-trivial amount of damage has been done in our schools as a result of TikTok challenges and whatnot. And how does that reflect? as it, uh, I mean, is that showed as a spike in discipline or a spike in referral to law enforcement or what's the story there? It does not show in a, in a spike in refer to law enforcement. It, and as we work through that, that's one of the conversations Laura and I had was, was how to respond in the moment um, because there were um, littler incidents and bigger incidents and you got to decide how you're going to move through that and what's the line. And we worked with principals to try to understand how do we want to move through it. And we worked through trying to understand how do we help kids repair and restore um, rather than moving for a ticket. In hindsight, was that the right decision? If we had to do it over again, we might have a different conversation. Um, but we made a decision in the moment collaboratively with principals in the room. And uh, so it does not represent a, a jump in tickets or refer to law enforcement, um, and, but it, it, there were disciplinary actions taken and, and several different practices. There was some suspension for that. Um, there were some restorative practices for certain. Thank you. DJ? Um, first of all, thank you for the data. Uh, as we were going through the first presentation, I have, my notes were, uh, what about the other discipline data? So that's fantastic that you guys worked that in. Uh, I, I'm going to piggyback, though, on the, another question that came up in community comment and is con concerning, I guess, is uh, about fights. It, it, have we seen an uptick in fights? There, there has been an uptick in fights in our community, and there has been more fights in school this year than we've seen in previous years. So our buildings, particularly at the four high schools, are dealing with and having some consequences for more students that are struggling and engaging in. Um, but there is, um, there has been a resurgence, not just in Fort Collins, but multiple places around what's called Fight Club. And you may remember the movie Fight Club. So that has found its way back through social media. So we've had um, reports from our, our, our police friends that we've had uh, several large gatherings across Fort Collins in the evening that that's what they're attempting to do is, is that type of social gathering where it's a fight club mentality. And we end up only finding out about it late and, and our police respond to it. We haven't had, um, your second question, I guess, DJ, well, I already answered the one about schools, where we have had more um, fights between a couple of students in buildings than have happened in previous years, as I think, kids try to enculturate back in and work through and uh, I think our buildings are working hard to to continue to build culture right now. Jess? Um, one of the things you were talking about was drug use and trying to divert some of the students and so can you clarify is that students using drugs on campus is that to them distributing drugs are the suspensions because they're distributing to other students or because they're personally using on campus in almost all those 18 cases that i talked about there was more than one student involved okay. um, in one case there was eight students that were involved in sharing some um, and all of those students worked with families or all of the in that case all those students were worked with families in all eight um, took the, the support treatment, if you will, or counseling, took the classes as an, an option. Um, I'm not aware of any that were a single student that by themselves was using. Um, I have a question. Um, and this might apply to both data sets from the um, referrals and to the discipline. Um, and, and this is 
as I think about how we partner, not just with our police, but with the county and all the various partners we have, um, and what it takes to educate kids, I'm wondering um, about an overlay with socioeconomics as compared to the, the uh, ethnicity. And I, I realize as we work on our biases and whatnot that ethnicity piece is important, but what is possibly at the root of how kids show up to school and how they behave, I'm assuming it has a lot to do with social economics. And if we're not studying that, we, it would be harder to report that our, our data correctly to those in the community that might be able to help us. Yep. So that's a question, but a comment. Christoph, I think it's, it's a great point. And I think when you think about the, the slices Dwayne gives you in all the other data sources, he'll do the same thing in this case. I think last year in our, in our monitoring report, he sort of teased that. And part of that was to tease and to say to our schools, look, this is going to be in the monitoring report going forward. And now that's the way we'll look at it in the monitoring report as well, um, is to dig in and see what we have available and how we can, how we can share out um, so that it can help us. Brian? I, I think the President Feb, the question that you asked I think is important. I do want to say though, both to the members of the board and the community is that I think as we talk about some of the things that we're prioritizing in the system, whether it's workforce development opportunities, literacy rates, mental health needs, they're cross-cutting. Mm -hmm. uh, poverty definitely is an amplifier, uh, but I would say some of the things that we're experiencing across the system are cross-cutting uh, around all demographics. I think all people are experiencing current society and current reality in different ways. And so I think it's important to interrogate that data and, and publish that. Uh, but I would say that our, you know, conversations with school-based leaders and teachers and even hearing from here tonight, listening to parents, uh, there is a real need for children to have additional types of supports, I think, across all sectors uh, of our community. I just I thought it was important to name that. Great. I, I just want to make sure we're kind of combing out the, the effects that could be teasing out, yeah, what, uh, what those might be. So, okay. Other questions, comments? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Scott, for presenting that data.